Okay. Well, thank you everyone for your patience. This is Cynthia Sneddon. I'm a member of the Cancer Center Education Work Group. And uh, thank you all for joining us today for this presentation. Please leave your audio muted during the presentation and uh, we will have a Q&A session following this and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. Also, you're encouraged to uh, put your questions into the chat. And as I said earlier, um, but just want to be sure and capture everyone's name. So in the chat, you'll see a link um, to register for this for attendance. And now uh, you will receive a survey at the end of the presentation, just a few questions to give us in the education uh, work group, some idea of what um, you think and what you would like to hear and see on these types of presentations. So um, at that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Patel and um, just want to thank him so much for being here. He's done this twice for us now. So thank you, Dr. Patel. Um, Dr. Tejas Patel is an academic thoracic oncologist with an interest in identifying novel biomarkers in thoracic malignancies and in the development of targeted therapies for lung cancer. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, followed by medical school at the University of Southern California. He did his internship, residency, and fellowship here at the University of Colorado. <clears throat> his research interests revolve around two general themes. First is to optimize clinical outcomes for patients with lung cancer by using molecular methods to identify prognostic and predictive biomarkers that allow for greater and more personalized selection of anti-cancer therapies. Second is to understand adaptive mechanisms utilized by cancer cells that allow survival following targeted therapies and to develop novel approaches to overcome these resistance mechanisms. In 2019, he was awarded the John Fisher Legacy Young Investigator Award during the 2019 World Lung Cancer Conference uh, for his work on utilizing precision oncology techniques in early stage lung cancer. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Patel. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for um, taking the time to listen to this talk. I'll be covering some practical principles of biomarker testing in non-small cell lung cancer. This could be a full course uh, in a university setting, but I'll have to do my best to condense it in one hour. Um, so let's... so um, those were my disclosures. So in the past 15 years, the field of thoracic oncology has seen an explosion in the use of precision oncology to very clearly identify potential driver mutations. And when I say driver mutations, what I mean is a mutation such that were to be activated would result in constitutive growth of the cancer. And this figure nicely illustrates uh, numerous driver oncogenes that we've started to identify in lung cancer. And it reinforces the point that about 45% in early and metastatic setting are currently targetable with what either what we call small mo molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors or monoclonal antibodies. And the reason this is important is shown here. So these are the cancer incidence and death estimates from the SEER cancer database. And if you posit that about 119,100 cases of lung cancer will be diagnosed in men, and 116,660 will be diagnosed in women, you come up with 235,760 cases of lung cancer. Now, um, if you posit that 84% of these cases will be non-small cell lung cancer, so we're gonna exclude small cell cancer for the moment for this discussion, and then you get, grant me that assumption that about 40 to 45% of them will have a driver oncogene. We're looking at about 88,424 cases of non-small cell lung cancer with a driver oncogene. And why is this relevant? Well, first of all, just to give you a sense of the scale, 
This is the estimated cases of pancreas cancer. And knowing the driver oncogene is relevant because it reinforces the point that targeted therapy is a mainstay of treatment for patients with lung cancer and is actually very common. So these are uh, currently therapies that are approved with the FDA. The ones that are bolded are the ones that are FDA approved. And the field is changing so quickly that um, we have two new therapies. So there's both amivantamab and then there's also uh, sotorasib now for KRAS G12C. And I imagine that by next year, I'll have to update this slide because more of these will be approved. So before we talk about therapies, let's go to uh, pathology 101. When we think of biomarkers, it's helpful to go back to the basics. And some of the key terms and that we need when we're understanding biomarkers is we have to have a sense of what tissue is available. And a block refers to a paraffin block in which tissue has been embedded. And it's important to understand this is a finite resource. So when the block has been cut numerous times and there's nothing left, that is referred to as the block being exhausted or depleted. And how long a block will last mostly depends on how much tissue went into it to begin with. And this is a problem for lung cancer specifically because the nature of getting lung tissue is complicated and oftentimes fraught with potential complications. And so our sample is much different than some other cancer subtypes where it's much easier to get tissue. H and E is a, stands for hematoxylin and eosin stain. And what this is, is this is the standard stain that pathologists use to look at the tissue, and it's oftentimes used to make a morphological diagnosis. And so here is where you can get some initial information, whether something looks like small cell lung cancer or non-small cell lung cancer. Now, and then we kind of uh, blew past this, but FFPE is um, formalin fixed paraffin embedded. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but the, understand that the process of doing this um, can compromise DNA and RNA. This has implications for molecular testing. So when we speak about molecular testing, there is always a balancing act. Um, we, uh, it's helpful to kind of think of it as a, um, a trade-off between clinical sensitivity and analytic sensitivity. And so what we mean when we say clinical sensitivity are how many possible mutations can a test detect? And so this would be um, an EGFR test that only looks for L858R or exon 19 deletion mutations, will only look for that, but will not look for G719 or exon 20 insertions. And so these kind of designs are prone to false negatives because the negatives are gonna be outside of the test design. Analytic sensitivity is how well can a test detect a rare change among normal? And so here, when you have a false negative, it's probably related to the fact that your tissue didn't have enough tumor to begin with. So an example of this is a pleural cell block where there's a lot of reactive mesothelial cells, but very few tumor cells. If you get a negative result here, it's not because the test was bad. It was because you never had enough tissue to begin with. And this is... In, clinic, in clinician speak, what we're really seeing here is I like the needles and haystacks analogy that Dr. Dara Eisner uses in some of her talks. So a test with high clinical sensitivity can identify needles of many colors in a haystack, but these needles need to be present at a high level. A test with analytic sensitivity can identify only a couple of needles, but can pick them out even when they're extremely rare. And it's this trade-off that is part of the art of balancing tissue with um, molecular testing. So when we speak of molecular testing, there are four common methodologies that we use. There's immunohistochemistry, there's FISH, there's PCR, and there's next generation sequencing. So immunohistochemistry selectively identifies antigens or proteins in the cells of a tissue section by use of specific antibodies. And there's really two ways you can visualize these. So one is something called a chromogenic IHC. So this is where an antibody is conjugated to an enzyme uh, that can catalyze a color producing reaction. The other method is through immunofluorescence where an antibody is talked to a fluorophore. And in non-small cell lung cancer, some standard stains that we would use are TTF1, NAPSIN-A, P40, P63, 
CK7 and CK20. And on the right here is an example of one of the immunostains being used. And it clearly shows positivity because of uh, either chromogenic IHC or immunofluorescence uh, method. So practically, what does this mean? So in lung cancer, there are a couple of uses for IHC. It can be used to confirm ALK positivity. We'll talk a little bit more about the ALK gene rearrangement later in this talk, but in resource limited settings, you can use a very specific antibody called a D5F3 antibody, which if positive does confirm ALK gene rearrangement. It is used for PDL1 tumor proportion scores. So when you order a PDL1 test, it's important to recognize that this is an IHC test. This is why you can't get PDL1 scores on uh, blood tests like circulating tumor DNA assays, which we'll also talk about. And importantly, it's used as a target in antibody drug conjugate trials. And this is just a brief summary of some ongoing clinical trials with uh, the antibody drug conjugate listed on the left-hand side and the target in the middle. And just to be clear, an antibody drug conjugate, what it is, is it's a three-part um, molecule. So the first part is a monoclonal antibody which is engineered to the target. So in this case, we'll use the first example, HER2. There's a linker molecule, and then this is connected to what's called the payload. And that's typically a very toxic chemotherapy. But this three-part structure then is thought to be highly effective because you're delivering high doses of chemotherapy in a selective fashion. Um, another important method of molecular testing is something called fluorescence in situ hybridization. And this is where we use fluoropore coupled nucleotides as probes to examine the presence or absence of complementary sequences in uh, fixed cells or tissues under a microscope. And part of the challenges with FISH is that it requires extensive testing of normal tissues to be performed to understand what these thresholds are. Some examples we use in lung cancer are for identifying gene fusion, some of which I've listed here, and for gene amplification. So for using gene, detecting gene fusions, ALK is a really good example of this. And historically, this was how ALK gene fusions or gene rearrangements were detected. Um, the fusion in ALK occurs from an inversion on chromosome two. And um, there's considered ALK positive when you have a split green signal. And so what this is, is um, the reason that this works in ALK is that you have, so you have numerous fusion variants in ALK, and thanks to the special structure of the probe, you can get two differently labeled short sequence DNAs at the breakpoints of the ALK gene. And it's this short distance that um, uh, is called a subtle split signal between the red and green parts of the probe that uh, yields uh, overlapping signals. And this is what's well, I don't know if I have a picture here. Okay, so um, let me just go back one slide. Just, so you, here you can see in the right examples of probes that are lighting up. And when you have a green and a red signal in close proximity to each other, it would be considered positive. Um, so, let's see here. so I should mention that um, what's considered positive for fish is when more than 15 cells or 15% out of 100 cells analyzed show these split signals. And so this, again, reinforces the importance of quality of specimen for doing testing. And in fish, it's very important that we have high uh, quantity of specimen to be able to do this kind of analysis. Another method for using fish is for gene amplification. So, Gene amplification is an interesting phenomenon in cancer. And there's a problem inherent to the term because we are always trying to contrast gene amplification with something called polysomy. So with FISH, you can localize a gene sequence of interest and compare it to the centromeric portion of the chromosome. And so in polysomy, which is shown in the middle here, What's happening really is that there's high levels of chromosomal expansion, but it's not due to any kind of specific driver. It's really just that the cells themselves are highly genetically unstable. And what you will see is high gene copy numbers shown in red here, but you will also note that because there's high levels of chromosomal instability, 
the centromeric portion will match that. And so when you do a ratio of target gene to centromere portion, it should approximate one. In true gene amplification, which is where we think that there's an oncogenic driver and it's occurring because gene copy numbers are going through the roof at a specific segment of the chromosome, you'll notice that the ratio is gonna be much higher than one. And so this can be actually somewhat useful in determining polysomy versus true gene amplification. In lung cancer, this has been an area of controversy. So Sinead Newman, who was a fellow at our uh, lung cancer program years ago, published this paper, which is a very nice um, summary of some of the challenges we see. But what she showed that was really interesting was that when you look at a gene, um, so here they're looking at MET, but when you look at a MET to SEP7 ratio greater than or equal to five, what you notice is that you almost find no other oncogene overlaps. And so this is a potentially good threshold to determine what is considered, quote, true gene amplification. Though I should mention that this is a continuously evolving area and the thresholds can be different for different genes. So MET may have this threshold, HER2 may have a different threshold and it becomes extremely complicated. Another method of biomarker testing is what we call PCR-based testing. And so I like to think of PCR as simply molecular photocopying. So what you're doing here is you take a DNA region of interest you identify primers for that region of interest. You denature the DNA by heating it and you use something called TAC polymerase. So these are very unique um, polymerase uh, enzymes that work in high heat environments. So, um, and what these can do is they can create new strands of DNA from primers. And then you essentially rinse and repeat. So you're doing, um, identify regions of interest, heating it up, using this unique TAC polymerase to create new DNA, cooling it down, heating it up, cooling it down. And there's multiple modifications to this method. So there's something called the reverse transcriptase methods, which uses mRNA as a template. There's real-time PCR, which uses amplification. And then there's multiplex PCR, where you can actually look at more than one target sequence. And so... PCR is particularly good when you're trying to find a specific mutation, as we pointed out earlier. So for example, an egfr l 58 r or a BRAF b 600 e mutation, these are very easily detected by PCR. The problem comes is when you start to have complicated and diverse mutations. So I'm here highlighting an example, which is egfr exon 20 So this was work presented by Josh Baumel at uh, JTO. And what they showed is that EGFR exon 20, it's a very diverse subset. We say these mutations as if they were a single thing, but they really are not. And it's difficult to design primers and probes to cover every potential alteration that you're seeing on this screen. And so this is an example where PCR may be a bit limited in picking up this specific mutation. So that brings me to next generation sequencing. This is another form of biomarker testing. And it's really important to recognize that NGS is a platform, it is not a standardized test. So when you say you're ordering next generation sequencing, that is not a thing. Next generation sequencing is performed by, and there's many commercial entities like Foundation, Keras, Tempest, Archer. But important to know that each of these companies will have different probes that they use for their gene panels. It's important to know that certain alterations are more challenging to report from a bioinformatics perspective. So specifically gene fusions, gene amplification and tumor mutational burden are somewhat complicated and are not necessarily standardized, especially tumor mutational burden. Um, it's important to recognize the differences between DNA and RNA. We'll cover this a little bit more. And finally, it's important to be cautious in interpreting gene amplification, especially if you see this on a foundation medicine report. So these are some different types of next generation sequencing. The most common is DNA NGS through capture. Um, RNA NGS, there's, a, there's two forms, there's amplicon and then there's RNA NGS capture, and we'll kind of cover those briefly. So let's just do a big picture view of what's the benefit of doing DNA versus RNA NGS. So one of the challenges with DNA-based NGS, which is overwhelmingly the most common form of next generation sequencing, um, a potential area where this could be problematic is if you have 
genomic rearrangements or mutations that occur in intronic sequences. So introns are these long repetitive sequences of DNA. They're extremely hard to sequence because there's tons of repetitive genetic code in them. And the, what's problematic is if fusions occur in this area, this intronic sequence, it is extremely difficult to guess what the primer will be. And you can circumvent this whole problem if you just look at the RNA transcript. So in the process of DNA becoming RNA, there are, um, part of the process is removal of these intronic sequences. So if you just focus on the RNA transcript, you can actually find all kinds of novel fusion partners just by looking there specifically. Now, the big knock on RNA is that it is extremely dependent on the quality of RNA. And sometimes this is terrible, especially if you're getting bone specimens. Um, so this is an example of amplicon testing through DNA NGO. So here what's happening is RNA from tissue is used to make DNA. And then I, I pointed this out earlier, but you, you'll need separate probes for each five prime event. So it's very common in ALK fusions to have something like EML4 ALK fusion. So just by convention, anything that's put in the front of this kind of fusion nomenclature is a five prime end, and anything put at the uh, back is a three prime end. And so we oftentimes know we're looking for ALK, but we have to assume that we know what ALK is fused with. And there you need to have primers. And so the most common in lung cancer is EML4. But if there's a novel fusion partners and they do exist, um, it will only, this kind of method will only work if you knew for certain that you're looking for EML4. But if there was some random new partner, let's call it XYZ, it wouldn't work. It won't detect it. And so that's a challenge with DNA-based NGS testing and a limitation. And this is shown very nicely by work done here. So this was work done by Kurt Davies, who looked at a very specific mutation in lung cancer called Medexon 14. So this is a relatively rare mutation. It's very difficult to diagnose for that reason I outlined before, which is that a lot of these mutations are in intronic sequences. So if you look at DNA-based analyses, you'll pick up some of these. But if you look at RNA-based analysis, you capture way more. And then this was shown very nicely in a, a seminal paper by Benayet et al. This was out of Sloan Kettering. And here they looked at 2,522 cases of lung adenocarcinomas that were, quote, driver negative, meaning they had been sequenced through the MSK impact panel. And what they did was they went back to these specimens, did RNA extraction, and then resequenced 254 of them. And what they found was that about 15.5% of these cases had driver mutations that had all been negative by DNA NGS. So let's pivot a little bit to looking at practical applications in lung cancer. So this is an evolving field, but I will say that in general, every patient with lung cancer should get broad-based molecular testing. When you have limited tissue, you have to make some difficult decisions about what you prioritize. And I would argue that you must prioritize EGFR, ALK, ROS1, and BRAF, just because these have clear FDA-approved targeted therapies. This space is rapidly changing, and I would start to say that RET, MET, and KRAS are, are going to start to fill this place as well. A key concept is that driver oncogenes generally tend to be mutually exclusive. So if you found a KRAS mutation, generally speaking, it's gonna be extraordinarily unlikely you're also gonna harbor a ROS1 gene rearrangement. And then there's also MSI, which we can talk about a little bit later. So these are the current actionable oncogenes, and these are the testing methods that we typically use for them. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that RNA NGS may be better for MET exon 14 gene fusions, and uh, FISH may be better for gene amplification than NGS. So let's cover EGFR mutations. So EGFR pathway normally requires an EGF ligand to initiate signaling. And upon ligand signaling, you get a regulatory C helix that pivots from an outward inactive conformation, so that's shown here on the left, to an active confirmation. And here you get key interaction in the phosphate binding loop in the active site shown here. So what happens when you have 
deletions or mutations in the EGFR structure, and here we'll just use EGFR exon 19 as an example, is that they pull this alpha helix structure from the N terminal, which is here uh, normally uh, here, um, into and they bring this kind of edge point to the vicinity of the ATP binding catalytic site. And so you start to get asymmetric dimer interfacing. And then this is what's felt to be critical and fundamental to EG for activation. So now this catalytic site is essentially exposed and conti uh, continuously activated. Um, You'll notice that we'll talk a little bit more about EGFR exon 20 insertions, but um, just know that due to one of the things that's really fascinating about EGFR mutations is that due to this, um, some of the conformational changes that happens with exon 19 deletions, but also true for L858R and some of these other EGFR mutations, is that you actually get a lower affinity for ATP. And it's this lower affinity for ATP that allows you to use. EGFR drugs such as Jafitnib or Osimartinib, because what happens, especially with the first generation drugs, is they're competing with ATP for this binding site. And this is a unique property of EGFR mutations. And this differential selectivity for ATP is what's allowed for us to develop drugs like this. Now with exon 20 insertions, you get the same problem, but the, the root issue is actually different. So here you get a push from the C terminal side and you stabilize the active site this way. But what in, happens in process of this um, occurring is that you get significant steric hindrance in the ATP site. So this is why EGFR exon 20 insertions have a much lower response rate to EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitors than your traditional quote drug sensitive ones. And why for these specific mutations, either a clinical trial is preferred, um, more recently amivantamab has been approved for this. And then if you had to use EGFR TPIs, my personal practice pattern is to prioritize either a FATNIP or OCMERTNIP. I almost never will use erlotinib for these patients. Let's talk a little bit about BRAF mutation. So BRAF is part of the mitogen protein kinase pathway, the MAPK pathway. And it plays a critical role in cell growth and regulation. So in healthy tissue, BRAF kinase is deactivated through a negative feedback loop once the signal has moved on to the next point in the cascade. And BRAF mutations in the MAPK pathway result in persistent activation of downstream signaling. So the challenge has been that in the past, when they were first developing drugs for this, there was drugs developed that just targeted the RAF pathway, uh, specifically dabrafenib. And what happens is that when you do that, unfortunately, resistance will invariably develop through MEK1 and 2 kinases. And so the addition of a MEK inhibitor was found to be absolutely critical to get sustained uh, inhibition of this pathway. And so this is why when you treat patients with a BRAF B600E mutation, you need to treat them with both dabrafenib and trametinib, so a, a, a RAF and a MEK inhibitor uh, to appropriately shut down signaling. Um, it's also important to note that a lot of these targeted therapies have been approved for BRAF B600 mutations only. So there's V600 E, K, and D mutations. Um, other mutations, and there are other BRAF mutations, um, work in a RAS independent way and they don't exhibit monomer activity. And so because of this, they bypass the signaling pathways. And so these drugs, dabrafenib, trametinib, or bemurafenib, uh, cobimetinib, there's several of them. They really only work for the V600E uh, mutation. Okay, let's quickly talk about gene fusion. So we talked a little bit about this when we covered fish, but essentially what's happening in a gene fusion or a gene rearrangement is a hybrid gene is formed through erroneous rejoining and replication of DNA. And so you get a fused RNA transcript. This leads to an abnormal or chimeric fusion protein. The key points I wanted to highlight here are that in lung cancer, it's the fusions, not mutations that are expected to be sensitizing in non-small cell lung cancer. So NTREC, mutations are pretty common and you'll see them in molecular reports, but this is not a situation where if you saw an NTREC mutation, you should not start this patient on larotrectinib. They don't have a sensitizing mutation. Um, we talked a little bit about RNA-based NGS already. And on the bottom right, I've sort of put some tentative fusion partners, common fusion partners, and targeted therapies that we think are highly effective in them. <clears throat> 
HER2 has become more and more of an alteration of interest. And HER2 is a very interesting um, genetic alteration. So what's interesting about HER2 that's very unique is that unlike other ERB-B family members, so ERB-B stands for a group of uh, multiple receptors, ERB-B1 is actually EGFR, and then there's ERB-B3 or HER3, but HER2 is very unique in that it actually has no ligand. So there's nothing that binds to it that activates it. Rather, its activation is dependent on heterodimerization from other ERB family members. And this makes it very difficult to target because it doesn't actually have a ligand that you can block easily. It can be altered via gene amplification. And so this is extremely common in breast cancer. It can also be activated through exon 20 insertion mutations. And these are actually much more similar to the EGFR exon 20 insertion mutations. And this is why when you look at clinical trials, many of the drugs that are looking at these exon 20 insertions will target both EGFR and HER2. What's fascinating is that despite having um, kinase domain alteration, so when I talk about that, what I mean is that EGFR exon 20, the mutation as we covered earlier, is at the ATP binding site. And you would predict that that would mean that you could use a tyrosine kinase inhibitor or a small molecule to just get into the binding site and block the pathway. But it turns out that historically, HER2 exon 20 insertions respond very poorly to targeted therapies using this approach. And so a lot of the newer developments in this space have been looking at antibody drug conjugates, um, such as TDM1, but more recently with TAC788 and some other agents like that. MET alterations are an emerging biomarker in lung cancer, and they're also a fascinating subset of mutations. The big problem here, it's very similar to the problem we had with HER2, that MET alterations are an extremely heterogeneous group of mutations. So protein overexpression is one form of a MET alteration. You can get increased gene copy number, you can get increased mutations, aberrant splicing, fusions, all kinds of alterations occur. Um, the uh, MET exon 14 is a really good example of the association between splicing and oncogenesis. So what happens here is normally this sequence for the, um, for the part of the metaxon gene that encodes this CBL protein in, in green here, normally this is an intronic code. And what happens is if you have a mutation in the intronic sequence, you get this non-functional protein for CBL. And so why does this matter? Well, it turns out that CBL is actually needed to break this signaling down. And so when you have a mutation that creates an abnormal CBL protein, you essentially then can't degrade the metaxon 14 Path, or the, you can't degrade the MET pathway. And so you just have ongoing activation uh, without the protein that you need to break it down. And so it's actually a very different kind of mutation than we typically think of in lung cancer. We think of most can, uh, mutations as activating. This is actually a sort of deactivating mutation because the protein that you need to shut this thing down is mutated. And drugs like capmatinib and tapotinib are what are used for uh, this specific mutation. And there's a lot of nuances here involving biomarker testing, specifically for metaxon 14, and also how to best define meta amplification. Another hot drug in the market is the drugs that target the KRAS G12C, specifically Sotorasib, which has FDA approval. So what's important to know about G12C is that they code intracellular GTPase proteins that bind to guanine nucleotides. And so the GTP bound state leads to active signaling and the GDP bound state is what is inactivated. So GTP bound RAS activates this RAS RAF MEC pathway shown here on the right in the bottom. And we typically see mutations in codon 12, 13, and 61, and this is what inhibits GTP hydrolysis. So you can never go from a, uh, you can never essentially deactivate the GTP. It's kind of locked in this conformational state. And this is what we believe is resulting in um, constitutive activation. 
So with these drugs, um, they essentially disrupt uh, and lock KRAS G12C into the GDB, GDP bound state. So it sort of forces it to be in an inactive state and therefore shuts down signaling. Um, and this is a relatively unique development. And historically, this has been an extremely difficult target to hit just because of how difficult it's been to develop a drug that competitively binds with these um, ATP uh, molecules. Let's briefly talk about PDL1 in lung cancer. So I had mentioned at the very beginning of this talk, immunohistochemistry, and PDL1 is used in immunohistochemistry. So on the top is the H and E stained slides that I said we use to look at um, determining what kind of cancer we have and understanding the morphology. And then to the right of that are several biomarker tests or IHC tests that um, identify the expression of PDL1 in uh, cancer cells. And it's important to know that PDL1 is a qualitative score. So on some level, there's a judgment being made by a pathologist that says about 50% of the cells stain this way, about 60% stain this way. And it's also important to know that it's a continuous variable. And this is important when we think about trials. So first of all, PDL1 is reported as a range. Different trials use different cutoffs, and this can be totally arbitrary. In Keynote 024, PDL1 score greater than or equal to 50% was used. However, in Pacific, when they did a subset analysis, they used their cutoff of a PDL1 of greater than or equal to 25%. And what's even more frustrating is that different companies have different companion biomarker assays. So the assays that were used in Keynote 024 was the DACO 22C3. Um, and then different companies like um, atezolizumab will have their own companion biomarker. And it's important to again highlight that some trials, most trials actually will collapse what's essentially a continuous variable into a categorical variable. So they'll take PDL1 expression and then they'll say something like PDL1 high or PDL1 low. And this is a very nice study out of MassGen that looked at what we typically would say as PDL1 high. So someone who's got a tumor proportion score greater than or equal to 50%. And when you look at response rates, you really see that the best responders are coming from the very high expressors, those with PDL1 scores greater than or equal to 90%. Um, as we're talking about molecular testing, I just want to put a slide out there to say that it's important to wait for molecular testing. And this is because, uh, and, and what I mean by wait is if a patient can potentially wait for seven to two, uh, seven days to 14 days and is, are not symptomatic, it is actually helpful to get all your molecular information back before providing them with immune therapy. And the reason for this is there's been numerous studies now that have shown that were you to start immune therapy, realize that the patient has a gene mutation such as ALK or ROS1, and then switch to targeted therapy, that the toxicity that they have on targeted therapy is much higher than if you were to have just wait, waited and um, got that information up front. What about blood-based testing? So this is a very common thing that is now entering the clinic. Tumors shed DNA into the bloodstream, mostly related to tumor cell death. And these small units of DNA are protected through binding to histones, and then we can actually extract and analyze this. And there are a lot of companies that are getting into this space, um, Foundation Medicine, Gardent, Natera, Keras. So this will start to become more and more than norm amongst commercial companies. Um, but it's important to know that circulating tumor DNA has challenges. So I am randomly picked three guardant reports from patients of mine. So here's one example. This is a 62-year-old never smoking female. The tissue testing showed an ALK rearrangement, but this is what her Gardent report showed, and I'm only using Gardent because that's what we use, but in theory, any circulating tumor DNA assay could have worked here. So did the Gardent test, quote, fail? No, they didn't fail. This was an analytic sensitivity problem. What happened was that this patient had disease that was only in her chest, and we know that 
the detection of circulating tumor DNA is directly proportional to how much tumor burden a patient has. So if you have three lung nodules in your chest and you try to do a garden test like this, you're not going to pick up anything. Versus if you had widespread liver and bone metastases, it'll be very likely that you'll pick up something. This is another example. So this was a patient with 30 pack year history of smoking. In this scenario, the KRAS G12C mutation is extremely helpful because it one lets us know that further testing is unlikely to yield an actionable driver. Two, the KRAS G12C might be actionable with sotorasib or in the context of a clinical trial. And three, these co-mutations might be informative more as prognostic markers rather than predictive markers. All right, so here's the last one I wanted to use, which was, this is a 65-year-old with a heavy smoking history, prior chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and now we did this blood-based test. And look at all these mutations. Surely this must be informative. The truth is there's nothing here that's informative. And that's because we can actually see high levels of TP53 and IDH post-chemotherapy. And so there's nothing here that's necessarily from tumor burden. And you have to be really cautious when you interpret circulating tumor DNA tests after systemic therapy, especially systemic therapy using chemotherapy, and not read too much into tumor suppressor genes like TP53 or RB1. So those were the caveats on circulating tumor DNA. They're very specific, but they're less sensitive. So if you get a negative result, like I showed in the first case, that is not useful. However, if you find a positive result, like you find a KRAS G2C mutation or you find an EGFR mutation, that can be actually very useful. It still should be reinforced that tissue is the gold standard. Um, it's important to understand that when you say circulating tumor DNA, they are DNA-based assays. RNA degrades way too quickly in the blood, and so you're not going to be able to do RNA-based NGS on a blood sample. It's very important to in, over-interpret the uh, variant allele frequency. So I'm just gonna go back on the slide and show you what that is. So that's this percentage thing that you're seeing here, percent CF DNA or amplification. It's important to not over-interpret that because the yield of that, the, that is to say the percentage that you're being shown in the report is somewhat proportional to the blood flow to relevant organ sites. So there's decreased yield when you have lung and pleural disease. If a patient has an isolated brain metastasis, it's gonna be very hard for these circulating tumor DNA assays to pick up anything because of the blood-brain barrier. So in summary, I just wanted to use this talk to really talk about the importance of biomarker testing in lung cancer, to help reinforce some of the basic principles of testing, to understand common testing methodologies and their limitations, and finally, to recognize real-world use of biomarker testing in lung cancer. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Patel. A lot of progress has been made, correct? Keeps going on. Yep. I see no questions in the chat. Does anyone have a question that they would, all you have to do is just unmute yourself and speak up. I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say thank you so much for that. I work as a budget specialist in the, for the clinical trials, and this was such a great explanation. We see these terms all the time, but not being on the clinical side, it's we understand kind of what's going on with it, but this was such a great explanation of, of these things that we're budgeting for all the time and, and getting included in our studies. So thank you so much for that. It's very clarifying. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Josh. I, I had a question. This is yeah. Mark. This is Mark. Uh, Mark. So when a lung patient comes through uh, UCH, um, what do we have a standard panel? Because I know you referred to like five or six, you know, um, targets that you would definitely want to know about because there's, you know, subsequent therapy that can be associated with them. But do we have a standard panel and where do we do that? Or is it sort of a hodgepodge between commercial and Comoco? Well, so Komoko is our is our standard panel, and, and okay. Komoko, Komoko in of itself isn't isn't necessarily a um, test. It's rather through uh, the tissue samples that get sent to the molecular correlates lab. Uh, 
What right. they'll do is they'll run it through Archer. So Archer is the plat the company that we use to do this. They have a um, DNA and RNA based NGS platform. And then for fish, we'll actually use uh, Vices fish probes is what we use here. Um, right. And that currently is the is the standard. Now that being said, you know Komoko could have just been like we get the tissue and we used um, Illumina or we use Keras or Foundation or Tempest or any of these platforms. Currently we use Archer. Okay. Do we have any other questions for Dr. Patil? Well, if there aren't any more questions, we will um, sign off. And once again, thank you so much for this excellent presentation, Doctor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye.